This is the most difficult social and cultural time that I have lived through. The news, social media, and even most of our minds are dominated by both the riots and the legitimate protests taking place all over the country. As we look out over the country we love, we see it in flames and seemingly on the precipice of falling into chaos and destruction. Despite the likely ramifications, both to me personally and to my business for doing so, I'm going to share my thoughts on this matter. I do not believe the majority of my views to be particularly controversial, but I'm sure they will be interpreted by many in the most damning way possible. First, I believe that America is not a generally racist place. The vast majority of Americans, including myself, are unified in condemning and decrying racism when we see it. I believe America is not a generally racist place because every day I see people of all color colors living and working together, and I see people of all colors at the protests around the country. I see that in a country of roughly 330 million people, only 255 unarmed persons have been shot by police since 2015. But of those, 108 were black. Every single one of those is a tragedy. And I believe it is likely that a certain portion of those were racially motivated, even if it cannot be proven. Using just that figure as a microcosm, 108 out of 255, means that black people are overrepresented. And this phenomenon runs true through all of the figures I've been able to find. The reality is, I don't know why black people are overrepresented in these figures. I do not know why, and truthfully, neither do you. We have our personal beliefs about why these things are happening. I personally believe that racism is playing a role here, but I also find it difficult to believe that it's purely racism and nothing else. I have read so many statistics it makes my head spin, but I have tried to adapt my beliefs to what the statistics seem to be indicating. My first real point here is that you should do the same. If your anger and passion is not informed by the available data and information, then you're not a champion of the cause, you're just a blowhard. I believe the vast majority of us do not want black people to be jailed, shot, or arrested at a higher rate. This is obviously not a good thing, and I think we'd all be on board for solving the problem. But we have to know what the problem actually is before we can solve it. And maybe it is racism. Maybe it is nothing but festering racism still clinging on to American society. And if that's the case, let's attack it head on. But if there are other factors causing the disparity, we will never solve it by focusing solely on racism. My second point is that I think we should talk less about systemic racism and more about specific instances of that racism. I do not know whether racism is truly systemic in 2020 America. I don't believe it is. But I don't know, one way or another, and again, neither do you. But assuming that it really is, decrying systemic racism doesn't give us any ability to fight against it. How do you fight against systemic racism? You don't. You fight against a specific racist policy. You can fight against a racist police officer. You can fight against a racist shop owner because there are specific actions you can take against a specific case. Talking about systemic racism is too vague and broad to enable any kind of action. My final point is that racism is disgusting and inexcusable. No buts, no asterisks, no qualifiers. Racism in all its forms is a despicable piece of not only our nation's history, but the history of the entire world. Any time a policy or decision is made that uses the color of one's skin as the qualifying factor, an atrocity has been committed. There is no excuse, there is no silver lining, and there are no exceptions. Alrighty, with all of that heavy stuff out of the way, welcome to this week's episode of Venture Utah. I am Cameron Porter, owner of Robin Hood Studios, your host, and our first guest this week is a purveyor of purveyorism, Morgan McKell, the owner of several very successful businesses. Uh, the one we'll be talking about chiefly today is Monarch Social. You know him because he's amazing. So, M Morgan, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks. I love being here. Thanks, man. So, real quick, uh, kind of give me a brief history of Monarch Social. Yeah, Monarch Social was born because um, I, my claim to fame in business, if you will, is I owned a brick and mortar store here in Utah. And I grew that store from one location to 14 locations across three states. And I ended up selling that. But inside of that, I really had to learn how to do social media marketing. And I fell in love with it along the way. And so over a lot of trial and error of like figuring out 
the right way to get customers in your doors by using social media. And this was, you know, eight, nine years ago when we started. And that was still kind of like a, relative, a relatively new thing on social media and stuff. But I had to figure that out. And so after I sold that company, I was on to the next project and it happened to be Monarch Social. And I said, well, I want to help other business owners get clients. And so that's kind of wow. how it was formed and, and born. So we've been around for a couple of years now. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So we were talking before about uh, how Monarch Social does things, uh, particularly on the social media side. And it's a bit different than most social media companies that I've met with or talked to. Uh, how, do, how is what you do different? Yeah, so when you think of social media companies, there are three main ones that really come to mind, maybe four. Um, you have a social media management company, and they will manage your page. They'll post for you. They respond as you. Um, they make your posting calendar for your Facebook, your Instagrams, or your, or your Twitter, whatever you have going on. That's the management company. Then you have an SEO house, which they play around with social media, but their main goal is to get you number one on Google, but they kind of are a social media house as well. Sure. You have a content house, people that make videos, people that give you GIFs or images, and they create content that they just supply to you, and you can do whatever you want for it. And then you have what I do, which is ads management. So we don't manage your Facebook. We don't reply as you or act as you. We actually just do all your paid advertisement through Google, Facebook, Instagram. Um, so we create content, but then we manage that content and we A-B test everything. And, and that's kind of what the, the ad side of it is. And so that's what Monarch mainly focuses on. So it's really kind of a specialty. Just yeah. diving in on that aspect and you're going to own this and, and make it as successful as possible. Yeah, exactly. Because you know, w w when you're talking about social media, a lot of times when I talk to new business owners or business owners in general, honestly, <laughs> um, they have like a gut feeling. I think I know who my audience is. I think this is the right way yeah. to go. And when you do ads, you, that's all out the window because we just follow the data. You mm -hmm. know, I can run an ad, an A-B test ad, and I can tell you exactly who's interacting with it, where they're going, where they're coming from, who they are, and then we just follow that paper trail, keep narrowing it down, narrowing it down, which takes a, a, a second to do. But once you narrow it down, it's like turning on the faucet and you just get ads in. You get leads in, rather, from your ads. You just get, keep getting your leads in. And that's why I like to focus on it, because in my experience, that's your best ROI is through ads. It's the fastest, it's mm -hmm. the most efficient way to get clients in your doors. So let's talk about, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of businesses, myself included, we we worry about starting to run ads because A, we're worried it's not going to work. Yeah. And B, we're worried it's going to be super expensive. It's going to cost sure. us a lot of money and then not work. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure you run into that every day. Yes. Uh, that, that concern every day. How do you deal with that? For sure. So uh, if we take a step back, marketing is just one of the four pillars of business that I like to tell people. In a business, the easiest way to think about any type of business is LIPS, leads, inventory, process, and sales right? If one of those is lacking, your business is hurting, okay? So when, you're not, when you think of leads, all that is is marketing. And so when, when a business owner, when a company needs to start marketing, it, it can be very daunting. It can be overwhelming. They don't know where to start. They're scared. It's not going to work. They don't know how much money, time, effort is going to go into it. The best thing I can say is, is I tell this to a lot of clients is, when was the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago, right? The second best time is today, okay? The same with marketing. Even if you suck at marketing and you just started today and you started some sort of marketing, that will pay dividends in the future. Once again, you have to get to that point where you have to figure out who your clients are. And not just clients, but you know, or, or your leads, but qualified clients and leads. That takes time to do. And so when you start on this journey, it does take time. Marketing isn't just this switch that you turn on and all of a sudden you have clients in your door the next day. Online marketing takes time. You have to touch clients nine to 13 times online. They have to see your, your, your products, your stuff, nine mm -hmm. to 13 times before they make a purchasing decision. That's huge, right? And so, yes, is it gonna t cost money? Yes. There, is there a way to do it with a low budget? Yes. Is there a way to do it with a big budget? Yes. Um, a lot of times when I sit down with business owners, I just have to figure out what their goals are, what they're trying to accomplish, and then from that I can get a really good idea of like, okay, I think most of your leads might come from Google. I think you're a Google search. Other times I'm thinking that they're going to be on Facebook and Instagram. And those all depend because those platforms range. And so mm. to answer your question shortly is it does take time, yes. Don't shy away from that, business owners. You can't shy away from that. That's just part of the game. And number two, I think you could start 
uh, a marketing campaign as low as 200 bucks for a month in ad spend all the way up to whatever you would want it to be. Gotcha. So, so it's not so much a case of, oh, it's not going to work, is that it's more of a, well, it's not working yet. Exactly. And that's, I think that's one of the, you know, one of the biggest things um, that we kind of offer too is at Monarch Social or, at, you know, these other places that are running ads is make sure they're A-B testing. Because mm. with that fear of it might not work, well, that ad might not work, but this is why we ran two of them and this is performing better. So let's take the money from that one and keep putting it on this one that's actually getting us leads. Mm. So yeah. That, the importance of A-B testing. So how do you determine, it, do you use A-B testing to determine which platform is best? Or do you kind of make that decision beforehand and just dive in? Well, the, the, beauty, the, the, the beautiful thing about this is when you think about social media platforms, right? Any one of these platforms, um, the cool thing is Facebook owns Instagram, right? Facebook owns Instagram. There's a different demographic on Facebook as there is on Instagram, the majority of the people. But the thing is, is when you start marketing on Facebook to a direct uh, of your certain demographic, it will market to those same people on Instagram as well. Oh, really? Yeah, exactly. So, so that's a nice little feature that it is. And so, nice. yes, you have to figure out your demographic. And I think that's where we start is we say, okay, what's, what's your business? I highly recommend when I start working with a company, a business, an individual who's trying to get clients, one of the first things I ask them is, have you done a client persona, a customer persona before? If you're not mm -hmm. familiar with that, you make these personas and you try to figure out who your real client is. With time, data will tell you if that's true or not. And then you can, you can uh, course correct along the way. Once again, biggest thing is just to get started. Has gotcha. to start somewhere. Okay. So it starts somewhere. It starts usually on a social media page. Where does it go? Because you also do websites, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we build websites as well. Um, w once again, it's all about where you want to drive traffic. It's, it, it's, if you're trying to get... I've worked with a client before that was a, a, an influencer, if you will, and he wasn't selling anything. He just wanted to blow up on Instagram and Facebook. Like he just wanted to be popular, almost, you know. For, okay. And he wanted to be an ins, uh, a motivator, inspire, um, an influencer. And so his wasn't to go anywhere other than his Facebook and Instagram. And so we made these really cool motivational videos, and people started following him, and we 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 got him a ton of followers, uh, followers and likes. Other companies have products. Other companies have services. So it really just depends on what you're offering. And, and what I mean by that is, if I'm working with a massage therapist, right, um, they, they don't have a product that they're selling. Right. They're, not, they're, they're, not, I'm not, they're not buying a product, but they're booking now. So I don't necessarily have to send them to a website to get that sell. I can send them to a landing page which tracks everything and they can book now uh, the appointment. If I'm selling, let's say, a product, um, a ring, if you will, um, yeah, we want to put, uh, take that person, that potential client lead, and c take them to the checkout area where they can actually check out. And so, yes, we can send them to the website. We send them to landing pages. We can send them where we need to, depending on what's needed for the business. How is, what is your process like when you're trying to determine uh, which link in the chain you need to change to, to get better results? Yeah, it could be it could be many different things. Uh, it's it's I know that's a really broad answer, but A/B testing is really important. Um, sometimes we run a, you know, let's use Facebook as an example. Facebook does really well with long copy and an image. It does really well with short copy and a video. Okay, so long oh. copy is the long read out, you know, really sure. cool ad copy that you have. That works great with an image. Um, and, and so when when you're thinking about like what to tweak. It could be as simple as the radius the, of, of your ad, um, the keywords, the likes that they're doing. But that's why we run those A-B testing because you know, if you have an account manager that's experienced, he'll be able to see those things relatively easily and say, I think it's this, I'm gonna make the best decision based on data, and I'm gonna go with this now. And that's how that makes more sense because once again, we're trying to take away the gut feeling of, I think this is wrong because of this. I feel it mm. might be this. We're trying to eliminate that and we're just trying right. to play numbers. I would love to play a number game and say, hey, what's your demographic? And you know, business owners have told me, well, 25 to 35 year old females. And we run ads for them and I'm like, uh, it's 40 to 45 year old men and women that are actually buying your product. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, just read the data. And then that's how we adjust. Simple things to fix is 
um, images, videos, your call to action. I think one huge thing that business owners could do right now is offering more uh, CTAs, call to actions. I, I can't tell you how many posts on Facebook or Instagram I see that says, hey, here's my awesome product. And there's no buy now or click here for more or gotcha, you know, yeah. schedule an appointment. It's just, hey, this is what I do, but there's no way to even buy their product. Mm. And so even just you know, cleaning up the CTA, the call to action for, for your for potential leads, that could be a huge thing. Maybe we made a video that was 30 seconds long and that's too long. And then we ran a video that was 15 seconds long. And that was the key. It was a 15 second video. And that had way better results than the 30 second. Same message, same everything. 30 seconds was just too long. Mm -hmm. So it could be a slew of things. I know that's, that's really a broad well, no, answer, yeah. but it could be a lot of different things. And that's the importance of having an account manager that really just looks at the data and has that testing. Mm -hmm. It does take time. It does take, marketing takes time. But it takes less time when you have the expertise. Exactly. You know, exactly. It, you could waste, you know, a business owner could waste a lot more money on their own because they don't think of all these little things. They don't think, oh, my copy is 30 words versus my copy is 60 words. It, exactly. And it, it, it could be that. You know, split testing the difference there. They don't think about possibly split testing different landing pages, mm -hmm. different, split testing different color schemes on those landing pages. There's exactly. There's so many little things. Uh, that is, man, that blew by. That was so fast. But uh, for people who want to reach out yeah. uh, to talk about your services, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, the best way to contact me is I am super social on social media. So you can follow me at the Morgan McKell on Facebook or Instagram. MonarchSocialBrand.com is my website. You can follow us on Monarch Social on, on Facebook or Instagram as well. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much yes. for being here. Thank you. Alrighty, our next guest is our good friend and longtime partner, Joe Rangel with To Evolve Coaching and Consulting. Joe, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Cameron. I, uh, I kind of wanted to open up with my watching of your um, opening monologue and just thinking about how sad I am about all the hate and frustration and, and, uh, and honestly destruction that's going on in our country today. I really wanted to wholeheartedly validate what you said because I could see the, the logic and the love behind your words. So that leads me to wanting to talk about circular thinking and bad habits and how we can sometimes get in the habit of going back and forth and doing the same things over and over again. So what is circular thinking? Let's def define that real quick. It's going back to the same thought process over and over again even though you're trying to shift it or change it. So. You know, really, if you, if you look at the world today, the world, in the most part, is wanting to affect the change. There's a certain segment of society that's wanting to affect the change in a violent and hateful way, which is probably not going to work out. Um, I think there's a greater part of us, like, like you stated, that really wants to see something powerful happen in the world to where we abolish racism and we abolish hatred and we get rid of things like that. But we keep kind of going back and playing the same record over and over again. So I think, you know, if we can, in, in, if you look at my coaching, if you look at the big scheme of things, it's a bad habit. You know, that's all, everything that we talk about is about the way that you think and the way that you can correct habits. So I look at that and go, okay, so why does sometimes, why do we keep going back? I was, I was mm -hmm. talking to somebody earlier today that constantly goes back and overthinks things. Mm -hmm. So we use a process in our coaching called Pivotal Moments. And she was saying, I just want something simple. And I said, but, you know, simple is difficult for somebody that overcomplicates. And we started chatting about that. And I asked her, I said, have you ever been in a marching band or, or been around a band? Or, and she said, yes, I used to be on drill team. And I said, so when the band pivoted, did they like pivot real slow or did they get to the sideline and it's a quick pivot and they turn? And she goes, no, it's a quick pivot. And I said, and if you were on the drill team, you had pivots as well. Did they go in slow motion or were they fast? And she said they were fast. And I said, so when you have a pivotal moment, you've got to be able to catch that thought that's potentially negatively serving you and then shift it quickly into a better thought. Mm -hmm. Not sit there and overthink it and go, okay, I wonder what the better thought could be. Let me sit down for an hour or two and think about, because that becomes a form of you know, rebellion against doing what you're doing it could be even creative avoidance, which then can also become circular. So circular thinking is going back to the same thing over and over again, 
even though you tell yourself you want to be out of the thought. That brings up a, a lot of idea, you know, and so I think there, I'm, a specific experience is coming to mind, uh, and it was an opportunity for me, this was a while ago actually, this was probably, uh, this was my, when my first was a baby, so this was about four years ago. Um, so I'm a, I'm a pretty active father, I, I, you know, I try to, you know, share the load as much as I can, changing diapers, helping with everything, keeping the kids calm, you know, watching the kids while, you know, uh, my wife is doing something and she watches the kids while I'm doing something, you know, trying to do my best to do that. And I was at church and I was, I had my one year, or my, my first born, he was probably six months old at the time, and he was really upset. He needed a diaper change, he was crying, he was hungry. He, I was also trying to make copies uh, for the class that I was about to teach, and um, but I was doing fine. Like I was, for the most part, I was fine. I had everything under control. Yeah, the baby's fussing, but babies fuss, and I knew that, and everything was just fine. And a woman came up to me and said, "Do you need some help?" And for some reason, I interpreted that. I just assumed. If it had been my wife, she wouldn't have asked. She would have assumed my wife had everything under control. Uh, and I'm doing a very poor job of explaining this, but okay. contextually, I think my, it would be very natural to assume that that's what was going on, uh, that that's what was happening. Oh, it's because I'm a man, and I, therefore I don't know how to take care of kids, therefore I'm in over my head right now, therefore I need your help. And it was one of those times, and I didn't pivot as fast as I should, but I realized pretty quickly, like, okay, Maybe, maybe she is. Maybe this is just some sort of sexism where she doesn't believe that a man can take care of babies. Maybe. But either way, she was just trying to be helpful. You know, she was trying to help me out. And it was unnatural. It, it took an unnatural step for me to not assume the worst of that, lady, of that woman. For me to choose to give her the benefit of the doubt and respond accordingly. And not let it become a circular thing. If I had felt like it was a sexist act, well, then the next time I interacted with her, it would be pretty natural for me to not be super polite. Right. And it's that natural cycle. I think that's why we keep circling back is because that's the natural thing to do. It's, it takes conscious effort to choose not to perpetuate the cycle. That is, and I think that's one reason why, bringing it back to current events, why Martin Luther King Jr. was as impactful as he was, why he is still on the list of the most influential people in the world. Because it took that effort of, that unnatural effort of not hitting back, of not rioting, of not doing, of returning hate for hate and violence for violence. But I don't know, that's my thoughts. No, I think that's beautifully stated. And, I, and I'll go back to your story on Martin Luther King. I, I find it interesting that, that people are not remembering that he said that the, the response is love. It's love and compassion. And I think a lot of people get mixed up in thinking love is the opposite of hate, like light is the opposite of dark and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Love is the absence of hate. And hate is the absence of love and compassion. And if we could start to live in that space of love and compassion, <clears throat> So many things would get better in the world. Would it be perfect? Probably not. We're probably never going to have a perfect society, but it would be better. So I, I love that you brought that up. Going back to what you were saying, it made me think of my father-in-law. He, he's one of the most gracious, kind people in the world, and he's constantly walking around and saying, can I help you with that? Can I help you with that? And that's not sexist. But then I start to wonder, is it generational? You know? And, <laughs> I've, had, and I've had moments of like... Ageist. I've had moments of like, no, I'm, I got my baby. I'm okay. I can take care of her. Instead of realizing that he might come from a place of needing to be needed. Hmm. And I don't know with that woman, she could have needed to be needed, needed to be, and a lot of women love to be of service. You know? So that, th that can just be natural. Is it sexist? I don't know. You know, my, uh -huh. wife, my wife tends to like me to do lots of things, which is very opposite of that. If I can help, more power to me. So I think it's valid, though. I think it's really important that you caught that. If you had perpetuated it, it could have been worse. I have a question. Did you let her help you? I don't... No, I think I said I was fine. I think I said, oh, no, thank you. I'm fine. Uh -huh. And if you would have said, that would be awesome, you know, 
you want to make copies or change the baby, would that have hurt anything? No. And would it have helped you? Even if you didn't need Yeah, that. I mean, sure, it would have, yeah. So that, I mean, my point in telling you about my father-in-law is there's, there's times where he'll offer help where I feel like I don't need the help. What I've started doing lately is saying, that would be great, thank you. And letting him, if he's reaching out and asking, letting him do what he thinks that he can do to help. Mm. But see, that my thoughts have been circular too. I've let that irritate me a little bit and I had to step away from it and go, he doesn't mean anything bad by it. It doesn't mean, if you would have perpetuated your talk and what it was making you feel, it would have got to a place where you felt inadequate as a man. I feel inadequate, I feel like I can't do my job well as a father, mm. as a man, and that's why you're wanting to help me. And I'm, I'm assuming, but I'm pretty sure she had nothing in her mind about that at all. Probably not. <laughs> so. Probably not. And that's the, that's the I, it's not, probably wouldn't qualify as a catch-22, but that's the, the, the interesting nature of the phenomenon is our, our tendency to be defensive, our tendency to assume that it's about us, or to assume that it's about a certain aspect of us, uh, where from the other person's perspective, they're doing the same thing. They're, doing, they're thinking it's about them. <laughs> they're not thinking it's about you. They're thinking about, it's about them. And so, uh, and, you know, it's really difficult to talk about these in generalities, these types of concepts, because it is. You always, you're always going to say something that doesn't apply to some situations. And people are going to misconstrue and believe that you're talking about the situations that you're not intending to be talking about. Right, so. you, can, you can shift that by couching it up front like I can make a statement about women and I can say, and I generally, if I make a statement about women or men, I would say this doesn't mean that all women behave this way and this doesn't mean that all men don't behave this way. Because it's, a, I mean, it's, you can't get caught up in absolutes, I think. Uh, one of the things that I've done to, to minimize circular thinking is to make assumptions, gotten away from that, stepping mm. away from that. So. I think, you know, you talking about assuming, if I could bring up a word today, it would be that, and if we could get rid of that and start imagining, we would really help our conversations. There's that old adage, you know, assuming makes an ass out of you and me. Right, yeah. It does not. If I'm assuming something of you, it doesn't make an ass out of you, it just makes an ass out of me. Mm. I don't know where that came from. But if we start using verbiage like, instead of I assume you're feeling this, or I assume you're going here, or, if, you st if we started changing that to, I imagine you could be feeling this, or I imagine that this might be going through your head, that's a lot less intrusive. It's a lot less divisive. And can, again, break another circular thought, which is assumption, you know, on, on anybody's part. We can assume a lot of things. Um, I had an instance a long time ago where I was driving and texting, but I was only texting, <sighs> I was only texting when I was stopping. But it was like texting, and then my kids were saying, okay, Dad, light, screen, go. And then, okay, stop, and then get to another light and text again. And I had a guy get beside me at the light, at one of the lights, and he was like pointing at me pretty, pretty violently. And I'm thinking, in my head, I'm like, dude, I'm only texting when I'm stopping. <laughs> it's none of your business. Then I started getting worked up in my head, and the guy started following us. We got on the highway. He started following us. I get off on an exit. He follows me off the exit. And I get out of the car thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get in a fight in front of my kids. Um, Cause that's what was going through my head. And we got out of the car and the guy said, hey dude, you got a flat tire. And that's all he was trying to do was call attention to the fact that I had a flat tire. And could have saved my life, my life, my kids' lives. You know, I pulled over because he was pointing at me and stuff, but I pulled over for the wrong reasons. It wasn't because I was pulling over to be safe. So that's an example of how an assumption can get you all sideways. But at least you had a great explanation for why you pulled out the crowbar, I right? Did. I did. I, was, the, I already knew I needed to change my wrench. tire, which would have <laughs> like, been a... Oh, yeah, I know. That's what the, the lug nut wrench is for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's no, but a that's great story. It's, it's the truth, though, and we can get caught up in things all the time. Like when people are in a hurry and they're driving bad, or we think that they're driving bad, it's an assumption that they're a bad driver. They're probably not. Every one of us have been in a hurry at some point where we've disregarded other people on the road. They're probably just in a hurry and in their head and not paying attention. 
So it's all in the way we look at things. I think that's a really valuable message. Uh, at any times, but at any time, but also for today. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we've got. But uh, a quick reminder for the audience, best way to reach out to you. Uh, www.2evolvecoaching.com. That's the number 2evolvecoaching.com. You can take our free assessment there anytime. You can schedule a private session with me anytime. And then, of course, you can reach out via my phone number, 801-850-2974. Anybody can reach out anytime, any day. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank and you thanks so much. again for being here. Thank you. All right. And that is it for this week's episode of Venture Utah. We will catch you next week at the same time, Friday at 10 a.m.